telling Brother Prysock, and I don't know if he heard me when he was saying all the things that he was just saying earlier uh, about God being so willing to do things for us that we better be willing to do things for Him, um, that I said, Brother, just go ahead and stay there a while. And the reason why is because that would probably be the best sermon that somebody could preach tonight considering the kids' crusade that we're getting ready to go into. Um, It's not necessarily the direction that the Lord asked me to preach on. I mean, we're going to go along those lines to a certain degree. But I want to encourage everybody, please do not leave. I'm going to try to preach short tonight, try to get this done so we can get this meeting wrapped up. But we're going to need everybody's help this year. I mean, we really do. And I understand it's hard. I understand that it's four days out of the week. I mean, I'm aware of all those things because I participated in every year for 18 years, okay? And I understand that it's hard. I've worked all different kinds of jobs throughout those 18 years and made sure that I was here every night that I needed to be, okay? But we're going to need everyone. So I wanted to get an electric fence, you know, a shock thing to put around the church for after service so nobody could get out. But instead, I'm going to stick the bulldog on you. He's going to be waiting in the foyer. And if you try to get out those doors, he's got orders to sick them. Amen. So we'll see what happens. Now, before we get started, I want to say one thing. Number one, that Adam Ellison is one cool dude. And the reason I say that is because he has fabulous choice in t-shirts, much better than his father does. Uh, He got me a Cubs t-shirt, and uh, I'm afraid his dad would have brought home some sissy bird t-shirt that I wouldn't want anything to do with. But I wanted to let you know, brother, I really appreciate you getting me that shirt. I think that is really, really cool. And I also wanted to say that it's good to have my favorite surfer in the service with us tonight. And I'm not talking about Kelly Slater or any of those wimps, but we have the great Kent Prysock, the surfing machine in Goshen, Indiana. And brother, why don't you stand up and testify? Great to have you, brother. Amen. You know, uh, I saw on Facebook he said he was surfing and things like that. And that's something that I've always wanted to do. I mean, I just think that that'd be probably one of the coolest things you could ever do. Um, but unfortunately, I'm terrified of sharks. And where we vacation, it's down in Florida. And on the Gulf side, where it's safe and where we stay, um, there's no waves. Um, and on the East Coast side, there are some waves but it has the greatest percentages of shark attacks every single year. And they even said where that Cocoa Beach, uh, Ron John surf shop, you see those stickers and stuff everywhere? They say that if you've swam in, the, in that county, you know, along those waters, the chances are you've been within 10 foot of a shark if you've been in those waters. That's a little too close for comfort for me. You know what I mean? So we were talking to him a little bit, and my wife was, and he said, you know, there ain't a, he wasn't worried about the sharks in California. And brother, I don't know if you haven't been watching Shark Week lately, but the sharks they got out there by Malibu ain't them little ones they got in Florida, buddy. They're those big 18-foot great whites, and if they get a hold of you, uh, you better make sure you're ready to leave this world. Amen. Amen. But I'll tell you, I'd be walking on water. I see one of them. But let's go ahead and stand for the reading of God's Word. But when you're as tough as Kent Price, like, man, that thing would swim up. He'd just growl at it. He'd turn around and swim away. Turn to the book of Hebrews chapter 12. And 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. Now, there's going to be two places we go in Hebrews, but you got your finger there. So Hebrews 12, then we're going to go to Hebrews 6, and then we're going to go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. Starting off in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight in the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race 
that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before Him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider Him that endured such contradiction of sinners against Himself, lest ye be weary and faint in your minds. Then in Hebrews chapter 6, verse 11. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 11. And we desire that every one of you do show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope unto the end. That ye be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promised. And then in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3 verse 8. For now we live... If ye stand fast in the Lord. For now we live if ye stand fast in the Lord. And I want to preach to you tonight a message entitled, Our Turn on the Track. Amen. Heavenly Father, we come to you in Jesus' name, Lord, and we love you so very much. Lord, we're thankful for the Spirit of God that we already feel in this place. We're excited about the ministry that you're going to be uh, using us in, and, and we're going to be helping to make sure that it goes well throughout this coming week with Kids Crusade. But tonight, Sunday night, and Lord, I realize we're going to have our meeting, and we're, we've got our minds preoccupied thinking about the week that's to come, but you want to speak to our hearts in this service. And around these altars, God, I pray that you'd help us to be more committed to your cause than ever before in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. Our turn on the track. Now, there's a lot of different people that we could admire because of their spiritual lives. I mean, there really are. I mean, for instance, you can look at all different kinds of biblical examples. Like when I read through the Old Testament, I like to study the life of, the life of Joseph. Now, I don't know if you've studied very much about him, but you'll see that he was a man that went through tremendous hardship. I mean, the Word of God says that he was betrayed by his brothers, he was sold into slavery, he was set up by Potiphar's wife, and then he was dumped down in a dungeon, you know, to rot that he didn't even deserve. But the Bible says that because he remained faithful, God remained faithful to him. And when you look at somebody that went through all that adversity and he didn't understand why and he didn't have any kind of answers, but he remained faithful to God that whole time, you can't help but to admire a person like that. You can also read about a man named Caleb in the Old Testament. We see that he was one of the spies that were sent out into the promised land. And and Joshua said, listen, I want you to go out. I want you to see what's going on out here. And and they went out and and, and Caleb came back and he gave his report. Now, everybody else said, listen, there's giants in the land and there's no way that we can take this. They're too powerful. There's too many enemies. The adversity is too great. But Caleb said, what are you guys talking about? We are more than able to take that land because God promised it to us you got to admire somebody like that. Who cares about the odds? I'm not going to be intimidated by an enemy, but I'm going to stand on what God told me to do, and I'm going to make sure that it's going to get done. I admire folks like that. You can also look at Stephen in the New Testament, in the book of Acts, the first Christian martyr. I mean, the Bible says that even while he was being stoned to death, his Christ-like heart caused him to say, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. While he was being stoned to death. You've got to admire a guy like that. What about somebody like John Wesley? I mean, you preachers out there, I mean, think about it. They said that he preached three times a day, every day. That's 1,100 sermons in one year. He'd preach to anybody that would listen. He said, the world is my parish. The most I've ever had to preach is six times in seven days, and I was completely exhausted when that he preached three times a stinking day. Every day. Riding on horseback. You gotta admire somebody like that. What about his buddy Whitfield? They said that he gave himself so strenuously to the preaching of God's word and to praying and interceding for other people that he vomited blood on a daily basis. 
Now, I'm not saying that we should cause ourselves bodily harm just so that we can be approved unto God. I'm not saying that. I understand that, you know, sometimes things like that's pretty foolish to do. But you've got to admire somebody that's that dedicated, folks. I mean, he didn't have modern medicine on his side. He didn't have the knowledge and the know-how that we have today. He just wanted to go out and do a work for God. And if it meant that he had to tear his body apart doing it, so be it. He was willing to do whatever. What about Charles Finney? He used to say, I'll pray myself hot and I'll study myself full and then I'll get in the pulpit. We saw what the results were. 250,000 converts that could be accounted for from New York all the way down to Oberlin, Ohio, where he started his Bible college. And when you look at men like that, I mean, you can't help but to say there's all kinds of people that we can look at their spiritual lives and we can admire. And the reason why is simply because they're so dedicated. They're so committed. I mean, they sacrifice and they give themselves to the the cause of God's work in such a way that you can't help but to admire the way that they've given themselves. But all those people that I just mentioned have one thing in common. And here's what it is. Their ministry has already come to an end. They were fruitful. They were anointed by the power of God. I mean, they went out to do great and mighty things for the Lord. But the fact of the matter is, with every single one of them, all of them are off the scene. As a matter of fact, everybody that I mentioned is dead. They passed from this life. And that means that the work that they gave themselves to is going to cease unless somebody else steps up and makes sure that it continues. It's just common sense. I don't care how anointed they were. I don't care about the wonderful wonderful foundation that they had established and started. The fact of the matter is that because they are off the scene, these ones that were so committed, so diligent, so dedicated, since they're not here anymore, things aren't going to go on the same way unless somebody steps up and makes sure that they're going to. Now, the Christian life is often referred to in the Word of God as a race. You ever seen that before? I mean, we just read about it in one of our texts. I mean, a lot of times it's talked about and illustrated as a race. For instance, in our text we read, Let us run with patience the race that's set before us. But we need to understand that it's not talking about an individual-style race when it uses the term race. And what I mean by an individual-style race is it's not talking about a race that one person starts off and that same person finishes like a 40-yard dash or whatever they do in the Olympics these days. I mean, it's not talking about that kind of race. But the kind of race that it's talking about is a relay style of race. You guys know what a relay style of race is, right? It's where, let's say that there's three guys on a team. Let's say it's me and Brother Jared Ellison and, and, and Brother Ricky. And we're all three on this running team. And I start off and I've got the baton in my hand. And I run two laps around the track. And when I run my two laps, I hand it off to Brother Ricky. He takes the baton. He runs his two laps. He comes around, gives it to Brother Jared. Then he runs his two laps. And he's the one that crosses the finish line. So I started. And Brother Ricky ran in the middle. But Brother Ellison's the one that carried it across the finish line. A relay style of race. And we have to understand, that's the point that Paul is emphasizing in our text. When he says, let us run with patience the race that is set before us, in context, he's not talking about an individual style of race. He's talking about a relay style of race. And we also have to understand that's the point he's trying to express in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, where he says, we live if ye stand. So tonight what I want to do, just very quickly, is I want to preach to you all five of those words in that verse and try to get us to understand the full meaning that's behind it. Because what exactly does Paul mean when he says that we live if ye stand? Well, we're just going to look at those five words very simply to get our answer. First of all, it says we live if ye stand. And we're going to look at that first word of we. Now, that first word in this verse is not referring to these men personally. Okay? And that's kind of an obvious hermeneutical way to look at things, being that Paul is dead. So he's not saying, hey, I'm going to live on forever and I'm going to experience the fountain of youth and I'm going to become immortal on this side of eternity if you'll just stand for the Lord. That's not what he's saying. And we know that because he's dead and buried. He's gone. 
He's decayed. There is no more Paul except for bones. And we don't even know where he's buried at. So that means that it's referring to what they believed in and what they gave themselves to. In other words, Paul is saying that our work will live if you stand fast in the Lord. So he's speaking here of the ministry. And he's talking about their preaching of the gospel, their equipping of the saints, their edifying of the body of Christ. He's talking about all the instruction that he gave to all of those new converts that he made. He's talking about the war that he waged when it came against the devil and all of his adversaries. He's talking about the furthering of the kingdom of God that he established. He's talking about all the churches that he started and all the souls that he won to Jesus Christ. He's literally talking about all the work that he accomplished and all the work that all of his other co-workers gave themselves to. When he says, we live if ye stand, he's talking about the ministry that he gave himself to selflessly. We, my work. And that shows us that Paul and all the rest of the apostles had an extreme concern for their ministries. And they wanted to make sure that it would live on. And that all the work that they accomplished wasn't going to be in vain. But that foundation that they laid was going to remain steadfast and true rather than dissolve and fade away. Think about the way that this man gave himself to the ministry. It was his life. Have you ever read through Philippians about the beatings that he took and all the different hardnesses that he had to endure? It was, he, he said, listen, I'm willing, I count everything else but dung. I just pursue this one thing. And that's the calling that God has placed upon my... That's what he's talking about when he says, we. We live. My work will live on if you just stand fast in the Lord. So now let's look at the second word. It says, we live if ye stand. And what that word live is talking about here is that all of the work that they did will live on if we will stand fast in the Lord, meaning that it will continue, it won't cease, it won't be in vain, but it will live on to affect and change people's lives just like it did back then. So what Paul's saying here is that their ministry can continue through us. Now that's powerful when you think about it. He's saying that that's what he wanted to see take place. He wants his ministry to continue through you and me. Now think about that for a minute, because if that's the case, then that means that we can expect some things. Amen? For instance, we can expect it to continue at the same level. Because after all, you know, if it's the same race, it's the same work, it's the same anointing, it's the same enabling, because it's the same God, so why should we expect anything different? We should expect it to go on at the same level. The same level of spirituality, meaning the same power that was demonstrated back then. The same anointing, the same enablement that God gave to their lives. We should expect the same effectiveness. Where 3,000 people get saved, like on the day of Pentecost. 5,000 people get saved, like at the beautiful gate. Amen. Acts chapter 2 verse 47 says, And the Lord added unto the church daily such as should be saved. We should expect that. It says in Acts chapter 2, verse 42, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship. The average shelf life of a new Christian is eight weeks. But it says that they continued steadfastly. We should expect that same kind of thing. Why? Because it's the same race. We're continuing the same work. So Paul's trying to get us to understand that if we'll take on this same work, we should expect the exact same anointing because it's the same God who's given us the same task, who equips us with the same power, so we ought to just expect the exact same result. Just common sense. So this verse is saying that their work will continue at the same level of effectiveness if we stand fast in the Lord. In other words, it'll live on through us. Then we find the third word. It says, we live if ye stand fast in the Lord. Now, here's the pivotal point to the whole verse. Because here we find the condition that has to be met in order for this great work to continue. In other words, it's got to take place. 
It's essential. It cannot be, it's not something that we can do without. This if is a tremendously big deal. It's two, two letters, but it's one big weighty word. It's kind of like a car needs gas if it's ever going to run. It's essential. It's not, it, there's not a question if it's optional. It's kind of like if you want to do any work on a computer, you got to plug the thing into some power. It's not optional. It's mandatory. It's kind of like a human being has to breathe air into their lungs or they're not going to survive. I mean, that's something that has to take place. And our text is telling us that without what's going to be said next, everything that we've learned so far is never going to happen. In other words, their ministry is not going to live on. It's never going to come to pass. And it's not going to be a reality, but it's going to remain a fantasy unless what Paul is getting ready to say actually takes place inside of our hearts and lives. Which means also that all of their work, all of their labor, everything that they achieved in their entire ministry will not live on like it's intended to, but it's going to cease existing like God intends unless what Paul's getting ready to to say next actually comes to pass. It's a pretty heavy thing to think about, isn't it? He's saying, listen, I've established a work here. I gave my life to it. It's the most important thing that I've, I, I laid down everything else to make sure that this calling upon my life would be established to the point that people said, man, these guys are turning the world upside down. That's the way that he gave himself to it. And he says, now listen, there's the potential that it, continue, it can continue on in you. And the same level of effectiveness. Nothing has to change except the, the switching of the guards. I'm going to hand my baton to you and you're going to take it and run the same race with the exact same power. If what I'm getting ready to say next takes place. So what is it that has to take place? What is this big if? Well, it says that ye must stand. Meaning that you personally have to stand. It's saying that you personally have to assume this responsibility. You have to come to grips with what's at stake and accept the baton, and there's nobody else that can do it for you. But if you do, you've got to understand that you're not just going out and running your own race, but you're actually continuing the relay race that was started at Calvary. That's really the, the proper way to think about it. I mean, Jesus started this thing off and then He handed the baton to the disciples. Then they ran their lap on the track and when it came to an end, they handed it to the next person. And it's to continue down through the years this far, but it's in danger of stopping in the way that God intends for it to unless we accept the responsibility and are willing to take our turn on the track. They've already run theirs. And they did a very good job at doing it. And now they're saying, here, here's the baton. We expect you to do the same thing. Because after all, I mean, this work that we gave ourselves to, I mean, 11 of them were martyred for the cause of Christ. I mean, this work that we literally gave ourselves to can continue through you. All those miracles that we did, the power that was displayed, the dedication that we exerted, all those things can be exemplified in your life. But you're going to have to do some things in order to see it take place. And he says that you personally are going to have to understand that responsibility. I want you to think about it this way. What would have happened if Timothy would have refused the baton? Let me read to you. Because it's getting ready to be handed off from Paul to Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 4, starting in verse 1. It's exactly what's taking place here. He said, I charge thee therefore before God, talking to Timothy. And the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word, be instant, in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. But watch thou in all things. Endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. For I am now ready to be offered in the time of my departures at hand. I fought a good fight and I've finished my course and I've kept the faith. 
Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, who the, through the Lord the righteous judge shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love is appearing. Do thy diligence to come shortly unto me. For Demoth has forsaken me, having loved this present world, and is departed unto Thessalonica. What would have happened if Timothy wouldn't have came? He says, listen, Nero's getting ready to take my head, son. You've got to get here. There's some things that I've got to convey to you in person because I'm handing the baton to you. What if he would have said, no, Paul, I don't want to take it. You know, I was there when they did all that mean stuff to you. And you're saying that you want me to endure afflictions? Do the work of evangelists? I see what they do to God's evangelists. What if he would have said, no, I don't want to take it? I mean, what if he would have said, you know what, I think I'll take the same road as Demas. I'll tell you what would have happened. Paul's work would have ceased. What was Paul's work? He was the missionary to the Gentiles. Who were the Gentiles? You and me. That means that we would never have had the possibility of salvation because we wouldn't even have known that it existed. I'm glad he took the baton. And that same calling and that commission that he's placing on to Timothy, Timothy gave to somebody else. My time of departure is at hand. Come quickly unto me. I've got something for you because this race has got to go on. The person that took it from his hand, it's went on and on and on until now it's our turn. What would have happened if Joshua would have refused the baton? Let's read about it in Joshua, Joshua chapter 1, starting in verse 1. It says, Now after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spake unto Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' minister, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise and go over this Jordan, thou and all this people, unto the land which I do give them to the children of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon, that have I given unto you, as I said unto Moses. From the wilderness in this Lebanon, even to the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites and under the great sea toward the going down of the sun shall be your coast. There shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. I will not fail thee nor forsake thee. Be strong and of good courage. For unto this people shalt thou divide for an inheritance the land which I swear unto their fathers to give them. What if Joshua would have said, Lord, I don't want anything to do with it. You're asking me to lead these same people that treated Moses like he was some kind of piece of trash. Caused him all kinds of problems. Lord, I don't want to lead these people. I don't want that baton. Give it to somebody else. What would have happened? They would have never went into the promised land. That's what would have happened. What if Jesus, when he was there in the Garden of Gethsemane, wouldn't have wanted to take his turn on the track? And he would have never uttered the words, not my will, but thine be done. We'd have absolutely no hope. There would be no redemption. And we'd be eternally damned as a result. I'm glad that all those men accepted their responsibility. I'm glad that they looked past themselves and they realized that they had an obligation. There was a section of the race that only they could run. God was handing the baton to them. I'm glad that they saw past all the things that could have deterred them and said, Lord, I'm going to run this thing just like you're asking me to. And folks, we've got to do the same thing. We got to see past ourselves. We got to accept our obligation. We got to take a firm hold on that baton and we've got to run with all of our might. Why? Because we have a responsibility. It's our turn on the track. It's our duty to make sure that this race continues because there isn't anybody that can do it for us. Last word. It says, We live. If ye stand. Now, if the work that was started on Calvary is going to go on, then we are obviously going to have to stand firm for this cause. Meaning that we're going to have to be determined, we're going to have to be diligent, and we're going to have to be dedicated. 
Brother Charles Pullman says it like this. He says, a Christian can't have a maybe mind. they got to have a made-up one. Think about that. I mean, if we're going to accept this call and this commission that He's placed on our life, if we're going to take the baton and put our cleats to the track, then we can't have a maybe mind. Well, I'll run until I get tired. Oh, that's not an option. Well, I'm just second string. I'll sit on the bench until somebody else won't do it, and then I'll take that. that. That's not an option either. He put it in our hands for a reason. The calling is universal throughout the entire church of God. Folks, we have to understand that when you stand for something, like we're being called to stand for this, that means that you are completely and utterly sold out. It's saying, this is all that I am. This calling is all that I do. This calling, this commission that's been placed upon my life is all that I consist of. My entire life revolves around this race that I'm supposed to be running. So therefore, I accept the responsibility. I embrace the responsibility. I give myself to this cause. I will gladly take my turn on the track just to see that this great ministry goes on and flourishes and becomes everything that it can be Through me. Why? Because that's how God's established it. Now, I want you to notice what this word stands translates from from the Greek. Because in the Greek, when it says, we live if ye stand, that word literally means to preserve. So when it says, we live if ye stand, in other words, Paul is saying that the only way that his work is going to continue is if we make sure that it's preserved. That's what it means, literally, preserved. That means it has to be preserved in its entirety. We need to make sure that it's preserved in its effectiveness, in its anointing. We've got to make sure that it's preserved in its contents, meaning we can't add anything to it and we surely can't take nothing away. And we've got to make sure that it's preserved in its integrity, meaning that we can't be a people that compromise this calling. It cannot be watered down or diluted in any way, shape, or form, but it has to be preserved in its message and in its effort if that same work is going to continue. Folks, we can't forget that this verse is a promise. Paul said, we live if ye stand. In other words, their work is going to go on as God intends if we'll just stand and make sure that it does. It's a promise. But we also have to understand that this verse is a choice. It has the potential to stand. It has the promise to stand. But we have to allow it to stand like God intends for us to. In other words, we have to make the decision that we're going to be dedicated to what God's asking us to do. This verse just has five quick words that say, We live if ye stand. And in other words, what's that saying? is the only way that it's going to happen is if we make sure that it does. So that tells us one thing. It's our turn on the track. And that tells us something else. We can't let anything deter us. Amen? We can't let anything distract us. We can't allow anything to turn us around. But we have to make this promise our everything. It's a calling. It's a promise. But we have to give ourselves to participate and bring it to pass. And by the grace of God, we can fulfill it in our lives. It's something that can take place. I mean, sister, if you want to go ahead and come. I'm I'm trying to get us to see that it's up to us. Amen? It's our turn on the track and nobody can run our, our leg of the relay for us. It doesn't work like that. I mean, sometimes they have, you know, pinch hitters and baseball and and things like that and people that will go in and and do that. It isn't the way that it works with God. I mean, when I stand before Him, you know, and if I knew all these kind of different people that I could witness to and and I called up Brother Prysock and said, hey, will you go do it for me? That's all well and good if He does. But I'm going to have to answer for that myself. There isn't pinch hitters in Christianity. It's a personal call. We want to say, go you. He said, go ye. That great cloud of witnesses that went before us, they've already done their part. Now it's time for us to do ours. It's time that the church of God takes this responsibility seriously.
seriously. I mean, everybody else did up until now. I mean, I can't look back in Timothy and say, well, I don't have to give myself that much because look at the watered down way you gave yourself to God. I can't say that to him. Can't say it to Paul. I can't pin that down on Wesley or Whitfield. I can't drive down to OBI and say, oh, Brother Taylor, since you're such a washout, I don't have to give myself either. I mean, everybody else has taken the baton and they've been willing to run. Are you? I don't know when the finish line is going to come. I have no idea. But I do know that I can do my part while I'm still on the track. I really want you to think about this for a second. Do you want this relay race to die out during your leg on the track? You know, something that really keeps me motivated is the fact that it says that there's a great crowd of witnesses. And isn't it going to be strange, you know, when we stand before the Lord and, you know, there's all these other individuals that have served God very faithfully, very diligently. And I'm having to give an answer for my ministry. And the way that I ran my leg of the track. And i got to look at somebody like Paul. All the things that he had to face, all the things that he had to endure. The way that he was anointed. The things that he accomplished. And then i got to compare myself to his. Same race. Same God, I mean, He promised it could be the same way with us. So if it's not, maybe it's because we aren't trying to run fast enough. Right? I mean, we're just going by Bible tonight, right? It says, we live if ye stand. Our work will continue in the exact same way through you if you'll just allow it to. So why should we expect anything less? So if we're experiencing anything less, Whose fault is it? You know, everybody starts at this time of year, or especially with the Olympics going on. They get all geared up, you know, seeing the, the advertisements for those things. Or if you've got a TV and you watch the Olympics and, and things like that, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that at all. You know, I'm just I'm saying, you know, they get, you know, think, man, those, those guys train and they train and they do all these different things. And it's like we get, you know, we get so macho in our minds over that kind of stuff. I wish we'd feel the same way about Christianity. I'm not going to let some swimmer like Michael Phelps take his sport more seriously than I do my commitment to God. Think about it. Let's go ahead and stand. And I'm sure not going to look at Paul and Peter who said, no, I'll go ahead and be crucified upside down because I'm not worthy to die in the same way that my Lord did. I'm not going to look at that man you read about in Fox's Christian Book of Martyrs uh, that was put inside of a basket, had honey smeared all over his body, and then raised up underneath a wasp nest so he could be stung to death because of the things that he believed in. I'm not going to look at them and say, you know what? I realize Kids' Crusade's coming up this week, but I'm tired after work. And that's four days I don't think that I should have to come. God doesn't give out pink batons, friend. They're not covered in lace. We're not supposed to run like this. He expects us to be soldiers. To take the things of God seriously. There's some kids that need the hand of God to move in their hearts and lives over the course of this week. You need to be here to make sure that it can happen. Amen? Amen? I'm as tired, man, I'm getting old. I'm only 40. Brother Boyer, I feel like an old, stinking man. I ain't been doing that physical labor in a long time. Been back there working on that annex. Brother, I'm beat half to death. Now, Armstrong, he's a young whippersnapper, man. He can do it all. But I'm beat. But I can tell you this. I'll be here this week for Kids Crusade. And you want to know why? Because it's my turn on the track. I'm not going to expect somebody to run the race for me. I'm not going to make somebody else run 20 laps that I'm not even really, because I'm not willing to run my two. Making sense to you? Okay.
So nobody's going to go walking out the doors when we say amen. We're going to come around the altars, get this solidified in our hearts, and then we're going to have our meeting, right? Glory to God. Heavenly Father, we come to You in Jesus' name. Lord, and we thank You so much, Lord. And we realize that it is our turn on the track. And Lord, we ask that You'd come down and You would help us to be as dedicated and as committed to our leg of the race as all these other wonderful men and women of God that we can study about were to theirs. Lord, we understand that the only reason they accomplished the things that they did and the only reason they were so committed is because You instilled that kind of dedication in them. So around the altars tonight, we're asking You to instill the same kind of dedication in us so that we can go on to accomplish the same things. Lord, use us in the exact same way. And we'll thank You for it in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Let's come and pray.